Hello and welcome to the PhD Life Raft podcast. I'm Emma Brzezinski and today I am talking to the wonderful Kate Massey-Chase. Uh, I do want to put a content warning out for this episode because it deals with failed IVF cycles and miscarriage and I know from personal experience just how tender those subjects can be. This is though an inspiring episode Kate shares how she navigated the dual journeys, the fertility journey alongside the PhD journey. And this is a story of great tenacity and great love. So I do hope you enjoy this episode. Hi Emma. Um, you've just reminded me just before we came on that we'd met before when you came to <laughs> think about doing a PhD um, and uh, so as we've just said it's going to be brilliant for me now today to hear the end of the story so I'm quite excited about that. Um, oh, well thank you so much for having me. Also we've just had a little cry before we started <laughs> <laughs> because this is a topic that is truly dear to my heart and obviously dear to your heart. That's why you're here. Um, so we can't promise that this is going to be a tears-free episode for everybody. Um, but thank you so much for coming to talk about a really important topic in terms of kind of the fertility journey um, and especially taking a fertility journey alongside a PhD journey. So that's what we're going to get into in a minute. Um, but before that, I'm going to ask, as I do with everybody, for you to tell us a little bit about your journey into the PhD, through the PhD. How how was it for you? Right. Thank you. Um, so I think when I was younger, I was always quite um, academically successful. And I think it was expected by I think probably kind of by everybody around me and certainly by myself that I'd go to like a, like a very good university and um and I did at 18 I went to your kind of a kind of a traditionally <laughs> top university um however um at the same time when I was a, a teenager I had quite um quite significant mental health problems and um, I, I I didn't uh, I didn't manage that transition to university very well at all, yeah, uh, right. and I really struggled. And um, after a few months, it kind of became clear that it wasn't going to work out. And I came home and I started university again at my local university. And I think um, one of the reasons I'm starting here is because it meant I learned really early on the power of like Plan B and indeed right. <laughs> Plan C, Plan B, Love Plan D, etc. <laughs> and that. Um, Love yeah. That. Because actually going to my local university kind of gave me the opportunity, an opportunity I would never have otherwise had, mm. which was that I worked in um, in HMP Winchester with the with the brilliant Annie McCain with them um, playing time theatre company, working mm. in the prison doing theatre projects, um, oh, which yeah. which really set me off on the path that I then went on kind of professionally and and indeed it, it kind of aligns with more with my academic research as well. So and it meant that actually during my PhD I was co-editing a book about prison theatre with Annie so so all these things kind of came together anyway so after my I did my degree in um in English and drama and then after my degree I went to Central School of Speech and Drama and did an MA in Applied Theatre and then I worked in the community uh, for about five years sort of self-employed uh freelance balancing juggling <laughs> multiple mm -hmm. jobs mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. um in a range of different contexts addiction recovery services mental health services working with newly arrived migrants um and um and, and during that time I, I had that sense I did really want to go back and do a PhD I really wanted to go and do the some some of that professional practice stuff I wanted to go and, and work in a range of contexts but I really did feel that I wanted to go back to do a PhD and there was a couple of reasons for that one was that I had a very strong um a research idea that I really wanted to pursue Hmm. And the and the other was that I wanted to be a university lecturer, <laughs> and um and I thought well that's that's the best way to do it. Hmm. Uh, I wanted to be in academia, and part of the reason I was, wanted that was that, <laughs> and I appreciate the irony of this now. I thought you know where stability is, <laughs> <laughs> a bit more stability, academia. That's a, a strong choice. <laughs> but when I when you're kind of juggling zero hours yes. contracts and yes. lots of like freelance, yes. you know, portfolio career. Yes. stuff um so I thought yes I'll go so I'll go and do a PhD so I went to uh to Exeter 
and um, and did my PhD. And um, thinking, as I mentioned before, about that transition for me at, to university when I was 18 um, was part of the, um, it all kind of all links together. So my, my PhD topic was, um, was looking at the transition between child and adolescent and adult mental health services and, and the possibilities for socially engaged theatre practice um, to support young people in that transition. So thinking about care and narrative and the embodied encounter and that kind of thing. So that was my PhD research. And then I was very, very lucky in having that gold dust thing of being offered a lectureship during the third year of my PhD, oh, yes. um, a permanent part-time contract uh, to start uh, in the September of my fourth year at Plymouth Marjoram University. And I've been there for the last uh, four years. And um, uh, so I did my PhD, I finished writing out my PhD and was awarded it in my uh, I finished it writing up in my first year of my job, which was the fourth year of my wow. PhD. Wow. Um, and uh, and then I'm now about to uh, start leading a new master's in arts, health and well-being at Marjoram, uh, which I'm really excited about for the autumn. It looks awesome, that course. I have to say, I had a little, oh, I had a little look and I was like, that looks good. That well, really we've got your good. book on the reading list, Emma, of course. <laughs> and this, it just gets better and better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so... So just before we get into the, the, I just want to take a moment because this will be familiar, I think, for lots of people in terms of that. How was that writing up and starting a new job for you? Oh, well, tricky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we were also doing, and also because we were also doing facility treatment at that yes. point as well. So it was yes. like, yeah, I mean, it's a very silly thing to do that many things in one go, really. Um, but I think one of the things that that was a real benefit was it took that find that my I was a, I was very lucky to have a funded PhD and the funding stopped and my job started. So right. actually, I carried with me a lot of anxiety in the earlier years of my PhD about what I would do financially. Right. And so having the financial stability and because I was offered a three day a week job, you know, not point six contract, yeah. I just didn't take anything else on in those right. other days. Right. Um, and then we also had a you know global pandemic that hit yeah. as well didn't we so yes, yes. <laughs> so you were you were in you were in it um, yeah. I th- and I think it's I think it is also just worth having that story out there and knowing that it, it is possible it isn't easy but it is it is possible um because I know some people think oh you know can I take this job can I do that but um it is possible but it is hard um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had quite a high teaching load and it was, you know, things I hadn't creating new teaching materials and all of that sort of stuff. And then pivoting online um, after oh only a, a little bit of time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot going on, a fast, a steep learning curve. There you go. Um, <laughs> um, but um, as I'll probably say later in the podcast, some of these things you get a bit of perspective when they're not the hardest thing you're doing. Got you, got you. So let's talk about this. Let's get into this hardest thing. Um, yeah. And uh, I say this is dear to my heart. I, I think a lot of people know that I also do um, a fertility coaching because I had a particularly difficult fertility journey. Um, and so I, it's, I, I feel you absolutely. Um, but tell us then a little bit about about this story and particularly about it being alongside that very mm. intense PhD journey and I think there are lots of similarities between the two journeys actually so how, yeah. how tell us about that yeah I was almost I was thinking um in, in preparation for speaking to you I almost in my head kind of planned out two like a like a line graph almost of the two things running alongside each wow. other because they very very much did yes and um, we uh my wife Gemma um and I decided wanted to we got, got got married and so I wanted to have a baby. And it was as I was writing my PhD proposal, we were doing some of that sort of stuff, getting ready to uh launch into different stages of our life. And um and because I was also offered, we were living in London and I was offered a place um uh funded by the Southwestern Wales Doctoral Training Partnership for the HRC at, at Exeter. Um, with Reading as a co-supervisor um, but we were picturing then moving to Devon and, and having these babies oh. and um, you know there was a very strong idea on this image in our mind yes. um, and um, and because we were going to be relocating my wife was going to be quitting her job and, and and we were so kind of had this very strong image of what the next stage of our life was going to be like yes. um, and we started and then the first part of that 
we discovered was actually it wasn't going to be that easy <laughs> it wasn't no. going to be and um it's funny this you know it's back I, that I feel like there was some naivety but actually I do know people for whom it was that easy so you can't anticipate obviously the certain and the for us the very very um multiple hurdles that we encountered but um but so we had to we were already on by we were already on kind of plan D by the time um, <laughs> my wife Gemma first got pregnant um and um and unfortunately I had unfortunately such a such a such an inadequate word so let's scrap that word mm. <laughs> and so it was you know but unfortunately miscarried um just a matter of weeks before I went to start my PhD so in the summer before starting in the so it was beginning of August and started my PhD obviously in the autumn um so that was right at the start of having just before I even started um come, coming down we were then tried again in the autumn and um she miscarried again in the November um we were waiting to relocate because we wanted her to get maternity leave from her current job nice. but after the second miscarriage we thought actually what we're doing is we're leaving the next stage of our life on hold and so what we're losing each time isn't just a child, it's our imagined future. Yes, yes So yes. let's not wait, let's just move. So we moved, and also I was a bit sick of the megabus. Um, <laughs> so, um, and yes, exploiting sure. the generosity of friends with their, you know, sofa beds and stuff. Um, so we geared up to move, and in the process while we were kind of organising, finding somewhere to live and all of that stuff, Gemma got pregnant again and miscarried a third time just a few weeks before we moved to Devon in the summer. So it's that first year of my yes, first year of yes, my PhD yes. was was hugely characterized by by anxiety and loss and and yes. certainly with I was trying to think back some of these they, some of the memories are very acute but yes. the but the the sort of when they happened and all that thing can sometimes feel a bit blurry because obviously this yes. now is a few, a few years ago but I yes. do significantly remember kind of going to um being on being in Exeter meeting my supervisor when we were still living in London and and Jem calling me and saying I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding and, and oh, thinking well I'm about four and a half hours away now so those moments of and then going to like one of my first kind of going to a research seminar in Brighton and then getting another message and and having to try and get back on the train and get back to London it's that real struggle of actually yes. doing some things that and also actually my first academic conference in Salford, um, I went the day after we discovered one, one of our rounds of pseudo treatment, hadn't, we'd had a, a negative pregnancy test. And then the next day I was off to Salford. So there was a lot of these kind of firsts, these PhD firsts yes. were happening yes. alongside in tandem or in, in, a, in a kind of interrelated kind of life way with all of these things happening yes. as well. Yes. Um, and then in the sec my second year of my PhD, um we I had my um so that messy middle kind of time but I had it uh, where I was studying you have your kind of upgrade viva I know it's called different things at different places but you know your yes. upgrade from Memphis. Yes. um and um and the night before I was feeling anxious about it and had a I was like, let's and also we were about to do another round of sensory treatment and Jen wouldn't be allowed to have a bubble bath after that so we were like let's yes. have a bubble bath before my um my my, my upgrade viva before we go to London and like had some kind of it's just like a really small these small moments isn't it but they stand yes. out in your memory yes. and I had some kind yes. of like weird allergic reaction it was like my eyes were like really pink and I went to my my upgrade viva <laughs> looking like I've been hysterically crying it did nothing for my vanity but um <laughs> but after it and it went well and it was successful and I remember afterwards just bursting into tears because of the sort of the adrenaline yes, of it yes. and going and then getting on a train to we treated ourselves to the train not the megabus and getting on a train and going for a uh, embryo transfer for implantation yeah, um for another successful pregnancy and that was the first time that we had a heartbeat at the by what they call the viability scan yes and then um a week later uh, Gemma started miscarrying on Christmas Day. Um, oh. So, uh, uh, for, for those, I think this is not my. I promise the chip the podcast won't be entirely. Oh, no, there's a happy ending. There is a happy ending. We need to but promise you know, people there that. There is a happy ending, but also, I also kind of, I don't like using that as a punch. I don't want that to be the punchline of this right. of this conversation because I think people have different experiences. For me, it's really important that that is. Um, yeah, I just, I yeah, I'm just aware that I'm going through a lot of quite difficult things. But I was just gonna say within, so within my. PhD journey at that point we're kind of trying to come out the other side of that very very difficult kind of Christmas Christmas yeah. experience yeah. 
was when I was analyzing my data. And that was something I'd never done before. And I think I'd been able to cope with some of the stuff that was to do with literature analysis because it was more familiar to me. But when I was analyzing my primary data, that was really unfamiliar. It was not something I'd ever done before. Mm -hmm. And that was when I struggled the most, I think, because I was I, I was learning how to do something and I don't think I was always doing it very well because it was also, as I mentioned, my PhD topic was I kind of took part of my methodology was autoethnographic. So I was navigating right. doing right. a PhD with something that was also quite personal. Um and that was I think the hardest point in terms of, of my PhD because I didn't I couldn't just re- sort of rest on the fact that I was quite good academically because I didn't know what I was doing with analyzing data I'd never done it before so that felt really tricky trying to write that up um yes. and and trying to do that while really coping with the really uh the real intense challenges of loss as well yes so yes I think that was um that was probably the, the hardest bits um but if you'll forgive me just stepping through the the sort of the, oh, the, do, yeah. the stages of each of the rest of it <laughs> we took a year off after that right. we thought this isn't this is we need to like let our body and our minds and our souls have a bit yeah. of recovery time so yeah. then while I was traipsing my way through that messy middle I we were at least having a break from trying to do that as well um and people will always tell you you're making, you know, you're making silly choices anyway, won't they? In terms of, um, oh, what are you even trying to do this at this point in your life? Why are you trying to have a baby and try and do a PhD at the same time? Isn't that a lot? And, oh, you've had a miscarriage. Why doesn't your wife go? But like we're, our bodies are just vessels. Yes. <laughs> you know, who are these people? Who are these people? You know, I'm not going to, Emma, it happened more than once. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I'm not surprised by have that. Have you thought about? Have you thought about? Is obviously <laughs> none of us enjoy. Oh, because I'm actually I'm not. I'm just, never thought. No, you are. I never thought about it. I never thought this one through. I thought I'd pay all this money. I put my and I just didn't think about it. Just didn't think about it. No. Um. But so um, so we had that time off. Um. We had had we'd jumped through enough hoops to get some NHS treatment, uh, which then just d- didn't work um and um after a certain at the time at which I was also starting my new job so the beginning of my kind of fourth year of my PhD uh we decided for we would try for me to try and get pregnant um so that's again like not like a great choice as I said trying to start a new job and finish a PhD and get pregnant and I didn't get pregnant the first time and then the second time I did so I was still within the sort of six months and that also we were just just in that just at that point of of things closing for the pandemic just at that moment wow. um and i did get pregnant and i miscarried twins in lockdown at the point at which the fertility clinics had closed and at the point at which you weren't allowed things like partners in with mm-hmm. you then i was also at this point trying to finish writing up my phd we had a, a necessary pause because the clinics were all closed right. and then um i went for we, we changed clinics we d- made a few different choices and um I went for egg collection the day before I submitted my PhD oh, wow. <laughs> so I was pregnant I was pregnant two weeks later I vivid at about 14 or 16 weeks pregnant and right. um I was awarded my PhD a couple of months before the birth of our son um and yes and we do also now have a four month old baby girl and um, who my wife was um who my wife gave birth to um who uh isn't letting us get a lot of sleep <laughs> <laughs> um so that's the that's the sort of pa- parallel wow. crisscrossing um <laughs> journeys of phd and fertility and loss as we as we as we went through it ourselves oh my goodness Oh my goodness. And I mean, I'm struggling even to just respond yes. to all of that, you know, but in terms of, in terms of just yeah. this, this space to honour that and all that you went through. Thank and you. I think that, as you say, that deep loss, that grieving, and I, I think that, um, and the future memories that you mentioned, they're so powerful. Mm. Um, and this, 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 your future babies that you hold in your heart and in your imagination and in your body for a short time and I think that 
it's a grief that isn't spoken about a lot. Mm. It's a grief that isn't. I, I will find the name of it. And oh, I was reading. I was reading. I read this yesterday in a Brené Brown book, Emma, and I I can see it on the other side of the room. I it's, definitely know what you're talking about. It's, uh, it's a you know because often when a grief happens, yeah. people gather and yeah. you have a ceremony and you acknowledge what's happened. And for this, yeah. um, it is it is that doesn't happen, and yet okay. it's so profound so profound and and to be and to be going through that at the same time as other big life changes so I think the thing about the, the similarities between that PhD journey and the and the mm. and the fertility journey is it is a big life transition yeah and it requires tenacity yeah it's working towards a, a larger very emotionally invested in goal yeah but you're responding to the challenges as you face them and the changing yeah. circumstances and contexts along the way yeah. you're doing something that not everyone can understand like people that you know who aren't on that journey then not everyone can understand or relate to or might even have might even carry some judgments about you yes. know what are you doing that for why are you doing it you know you could do a phd in drama (laughs) Um, or whatever it is or um i really wanted to to share today was how i i do think that i managed the i navigated the challenges of my phd better than perhaps i could have otherwise have done and and certainly seeing some of my peers really struggling with the sort of existential challenges of the PhD as well as the practical intellectual and emotional ones I certainly felt that not just because I think I found that having previously struggled with my mental health yes I had already developed coping strategies yes yes. of self-knowledge I'd built up a support structure I knew from experience the importance of setting up sort of support systems and structures before the point at which I needed them. Um, and all of those things, I've learned from yes. experience that. So I came yes. into this with that, the, that sort of lived experience expertise kind of yes. thing. And that served us really well in our fertility journey um, because we were, my wife and I were, were both, you know, quite good at communicating our needs to each other. Um, we both had res- so the resi- I find resilience a tricky word, but we had resilience from previous experiences, and and it also made it actually it sharpened the the loss because we certainly felt like now is our time to have a nice and much easier ride. But mm. um, but but it meant that we were able to 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 manage those challenges I think more effectively than if we had to come into this when everything in our lives had been perfect so far. Thanks. And I think that's true for the PhD as well that actually yes. having navigated early trauma that actually I therefore was able to to draw on some inner resources um but also as I mentioned have a bit of perspective as well about you know about the role of some things in your life and and knowing what's important to you you know working out what you need to be able to navigate that experience and I think it's a gift that nobody wants isn't it but it is a gift in terms (laughs) of having had as you say having had difficulties it then you can you you build up your resources and you find out how you work and you 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 have that in place and actually you know find often people who have had previous mental health issues actually as you say can deal with the phd much better because it doesn't take them by surprise and they've got things in place yeah um but as you say well it's it's not this is not a gift that we particularly want to have um but I, I, what something I was really interested in in the you mentioning, and I think this this is really worth talking about because it comes up a lot when people are talking to me about wanting to have a family, but mm. thinking when is a good time. I, I was interested in what you're saying about putting your life on hold mm. and deciding not to put your life on hold. Um, I, and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that and how that how that feels from now looking yeah. back on that yeah so so when um when I started my PhD and then it was also around you know the the PhD and, and all the fertility treatment stuff I changed the screensaver on my laptop to a Doris Lessing quote which said which said whatever you're meant to do do it now the conditions are always impossible but I thought that was really helpful because certainly people saying oh well why why are you doing this now and it's funny because at the start of going for our first appointment at the facility clinic and 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 maybe my mum or whoever said oh is this 
got this out PhD, this is a good time to have a baby? And I go, well, we don't know how long it's going to take. And I think I said it without really thinking. And I think I probably said it as a bit of a thing to, you know, to give people, like to get people to back off. <laughs> you know? um, but actually it was true. We didn't, if we hadn't started, hadn't started then, then, um, well, you do, you can't, you know. But yeah. actually for us, it was about it was a values based decision, and I think when you aren't sure what to do, if you just really centre back into your values, what was important to us was mm. we wanted to have children, and mm. therefore we wanted to to do it. And it's obviously it's a conversation within a relationship as well. And mm. in my family, my mum had us a bit older, whereas my wife's family, everybody had their babies quite young so she was already seen in her late 20s as old to be having right. you know, <laughs> where's and as an only child where's my grandchild you know right, uh, she was right. so there's different pressures coming from different family backgrounds yes, and, yes. And, and that kind of thing um but actually I I wanted to do a PhD um and we wanted to have a baby or more <laughs> babies <laughs> um yes. so we thought well let's do that and we there were points I think at which we felt are we are we being is our tenacity, is it, is it a form of like blindness almost that, that at what point do we know that this isn't working or when should we stop? And and that was really hard because we, that sense of hope being a really painful emotion and no one was giving us any reason, no one was giving us any reason to stop. Slight manipulation of hope as well in, in, in a clinical setting where they say, well, there's, I, I'm sure by this time next year, you'll be in a very different situation or there's no reason why this isn't, this isn't working. And therefore, you know, keep going, giving us all of your money. Um, yes, yes. But actually, well, that's you know, a whole other conversation. There was, there was yes, also indeed. one. Well, indeed, but there was also one thing that was a benefit of being doing of doing a PhD during this, which was you need to take time off when yes. you have to take a day off. Yes. If you are self-employed or working, yes. you know, working freelance, you know, after Jem's first miscarriage, I took the I took the day off, yes. <laughs> and I lost a hundred pounds for not going to work because I was self-employed. Yes. And I went to work the following day, which is it is which is ridiculous mm. because I was working on a summer school for, for young people when navigating transitions to secondary school over the summer. And it was, you know, it happened on a Monday. I took the Tuesday off and I just made it through the wet. I thought I'll just get through the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because that's 300 quid if I don't go. Yes. Yes. And that and we're yes. we've just paid loads of money. So there was actually a safety net of being a funded PhD student yes. that that I wasn't in as financially precarious a situation. Um which I appreciate isn't the same for all PhD students who who don't have the the, the privilege, you know, the no. privilege of being funded. No. Um, but I think there is something about it can be a great moment. It can be a great moment. Yeah. To, I think to... like six months. I think my funders gave like six months parent and um, paid full pay. Yeah. I got, you know, a matter of weeks when I was working. Yes. And I don't think I think one thing is that I don't find it hard to lean into gratitude. You know, when things yes. are stressful at work or yeah. or things are stressful in other things or when you've got a toddler who won't put their socks on or, or whatever it is it's not hard for me to to feel an incredible incredible gratitude I've, yes yes at the points at which things are hard I've still never been happier oh um, I, yes <laughs> how beautiful and I totally hear that and I think coming out of that fertility journey it is that thing of like Really, even when it is a nightmare, every day is an amazing, like I, I get to be a mum, yeah. like how yeah. amazing is that? It is true gift and I never take that for granted. Yeah. Um, and I think um, and I think it certainly is a very humbling experience going through the fertility journey. And I think especially for people like us who are used to being able to think things out and figure it out and make it happen. And then yeah. with the fertility journey very quickly lets you know that well no you can't this isn't a figure outable thing this is a no, this is a they don't they don't care how many books you've read am I? exactly <laughs> they, they don't. just don't care and then you can go well I'm, I'll, I'll find out fine I don't care if I'm an academic I'll still eat a pineapple if someone says I should it's I will I don't that, <laughs> you know here's I mean? the thing you become the, the person thing. that you don't you don't even I don't yeah. know it's fun it is it but is it's, it's such there's it's such it's such raw intense and 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 it it can take you to places emotionally that you don't enjoy in terms of anger or resentment or 
or jealousy or, or any of it. But, and you might be feeling them at a different point to the person. If you are doing it with someone, obviously not everybody is, but if you are doing it with somebody, you might be feeling those things at different points, which, which is, is, is another thing is another thing yeah. to navigate. And then while you're doing that, your head's quite busy and then you're going to go and try and write a literature review or a conference paper or something. Yes, <laughs> you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yes. Yes. There is something there is something that I felt very grateful for about the fact that I was doing my PhD because because we'd relocated and 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 I was doing something that was important yes. to me. It yes. was something that was completely different and was yes. something that was mine and it was something that I was creating. And I think there can be this real desire, this impetus to create, to be generative. And and I was meeting some of that need yes. to to create something at the same time. Um something very different um but but something that was mine which yes was hugely for me it was hugely helpful yes and creating a community as well of of of, of people outside of maybe the people who were on a similar trajectory in terms of our age and people who just maybe just couldn't go for a coffee with anymore and because we couldn't bear it um so you know meeting a new community and 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 lots of my friends were international students um or people I met through but other like parts of my life in activism and you know so there was there was that those benefits of as well of, of doing a PhD and therefore um you know existing within a, a really different and diverse community and not yes. least one where the food I mean with so many international student friends brilliant food to keep us going amazing <laughs> you need amazing. to be there. You exactly well I think the thing is it's like you said it's a very visceral experience and that yeah. and that actually can be really useful for the PhD journey to be to kind of to not be totally in your head and actually yeah. to come into the visceral but but perhaps in a less extreme <laughs> perhaps in a less extreme way would be helpful yeah. Yeah. because it's yeah. very very Absolutely. full-on very yeah. very full-on um okay I'm a, I'm aware of time and this yeah. I genuinely this could go on this and should go on these discussions should go on for for much longer and I, I always feel uncomfortable drawing to a close but particularly today in terms of all that all that has been here um but I'm going to ask you I mean I wish I didn't know I, I set myself up for these questions no, no, and I wish I don't, but this kind of I've got one can you out of all the pain loss grief and difficulty <laughs> can we have a top tip please if you could just synthesize that no it's all right I've um I've got I've got one and it's not just my Doris Dassin quote um it's I was thinking about this and and and, and beyond all of the things about setting up support structures and 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 and, and all of the stuff to do with um self you know, self-care and all of those things I was thinking about this and I think that my top tip <laughs> my top tip would be about if you have an imagined in in your PhD or beyond obviously but in your PhD, if you have an, a, a very strong image of what you think it's going to look like or an imagined future if it is no longer serving you trying to let it go and I think we can have a really fixed idea of what something should look like. And sometimes we don't realise that it's holding us back or limiting us or making us unhappy. Mm. And a little example of this in my PhD process was, for me, this was about the role of practice. And, and I I pictured my PhD um, um, because I'd been working in the field. I had friends who were just working in, not in academia, but who were doing the, who were delivering the kind of work that I was writing about. I had a very strong idea about the role of practice in my PhD and what that would look like methodologically in terms of how I would gather data. And it became clear that the best choice for the research was something slightly different. And I was going to draw on practice, but I wasn't going to do an original piece of practice. And that was partly because I didn't want to do some of the things that I was writing about not doing, which would be to dive into a situation and dive out again and do it purely for your own research purposes. Right, 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 so there was an ethical imperative behind why I did, but I still had this idea of what it was going to look like. And that was obviously existing alongside a broader idea of how I was picturing my uh, life in, in Devon, et cetera. But, but this idea of how, um, how I was going to do something I needed to let go of because it wasn't, helping me move forward so I think for me yeah that top tip is about if something isn't serving you if something is is, is harming you or is holding you back or is limiting you um or just not carrying you forward it, it's about finding a way just to just to gently and self-compassionately let it go and and and, and move into actually what is 
practically possible what is more possible you know is more is is able to happen or, or might even be a better a better choice um and there's certainly been stages across my whole life where i've said about the you know the power of plan b and plan c and d etc but but taking those moments to go and now i'm just gonna gently um res- like with respect for what i've been through just move into that next point in a way that maybe might support me and serve me better gorgeous gorgeous and it is that thing isn't it you've got to let go to have your hands open to taking what's coming next it just yeah it, oh, I love it thank you so <laughs> so much for that Kate I just thank you for your openness and your generosity of spirit and your just beautiful story um, and <laughs> thank you um, it feels important to share it I I hope that can be a very isolating experience it can be yes. really, yeah like a lonely yes. experience and and also I feel like queer stories just they aren't heard as much as well so for me it, it feels I think there's that that thing about the you know that the, the vulnerability because it is a bit it is vulnerable sharing yes. these things yes. Yes. um are hopefully um allows for um for others to find those points of connection as as well really so thank really you for, thank you for giving appreciate. me that oh really really appreciate it thank you so much Kate and thank you all for listening.